One of my first meetings with John was when he visited SRI in the 1960s to see a large neural network we had built to learn to recognize alphanumeric characters. John was skeptical of neural networks. He said something like, a machine can't learn something that you aren't able to tell it. John believed that the knowledge a computer needed to act intelligently should be stored as declarative sentences in some kind of appropriate computer understandable language. This commitment to declarativism was to be the central focus of John's work in artificial intelligence. Although John's contributions to AI were monumental, he coined the term, his work and vision extended well beyond AI. I'll mention some of these as I summarize some of the events of John's life. Other speakers today will elaborate, and Susan already has on some things. It was at Dartmouth that John and his colleagues organized a 1956 summer workshop on artificial intelligence, a name he proposed for this nascent field. After the conference, John moved to MIT in 1958, becoming an assistant professor of communication science. His MIT years were very productive. He invented the programming language Lisp. He and his students developed an early chess playing program, incorporating the famous alpha beta procedure for eliminating useless search. He provided the first suggestions for implementing time sharing, and he described the first proof of the correctness of a compiler. Regarding AI, his 1958 paper, Programs with Common Sense, laid out the earliest ideas for representing and reasoning with declarative knowledge. He firmly believed and continued to believe for the rest of his life that this knowledge should be used, should be represented declaratively rather than being encoded within the programs that use that knowledge. As he put it, sentences can be true in much wider contexts than specific programs can be useful. Growing out of this approach, he and Pat Hayes invented a formalism for reasoning about actions that they called the situation calculus. Pursuing these themes was to occupy the research that John and several others did for the rest of their lives. In 1962, John moved back west to join the computer sciences division of the mathematics department at Stanford as a full professor. Pursuing his AI and other computer science related interests, he formed the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, or SAIL, and Les Ernest soon joined John in running SAIL. During the 60s and 70s, SAIL was a shining example of what a, com what a community of very bright faculty, students, and staff could accomplish when provided with powerful computers, adequate funding, peripheral equipment such as display devices and printers, and associated software. Much of the equipment and software needed by the project to sell were actually developed at sale. John's philosophy in, quote, managing, unquote, sale was to let a thousand flowers bloom. He often gave good advice to people about how to tackle a problem, but if they did it in a different way and made it work, they got no hassles from him. The foundations for graphical user, user interfaces, printers, computer typesetting, and publishing, speech recognition, computer vision, robotics, computer music, and other technologies that are now parts of our everyday lives all got their start at sales facilities at the Stanford foot, uh, in the Stanford foothills. Sale was also one of the first nodes on the ARPANET, a precur precursor to the modern internet. Over time, Sale produced many PhDs and other graduates. 16 ACM Turing Awards were given to people who had been affiliated with Sale. John was always modest about his assessment of progress in AI, thinking that many discoveries and inventions would need to be made before we would have AI programs that reach general human levels of competence in thinking and reasoning. He believed that we would have to know much more about human intelligence and how it works before being able to duplicate it in machines. He wrote in one of his websites, we understand human mental processes only slightly better than a fish understands swimming. John had an all-consuming commitment to and passion for personal freedom. He was all for expanding it and for fighting limits on it. He thought that scientific advances in technology would free people from the constraints of resource limitation and population pressures. He saw the environmental movement as imposing 
unacceptable and needless limits on freedom. His attitude was best expressed in one of his sayings. It is deplorable that many people think that the best way to improve the world is to forbid something. He hated bureaucracy, thinking that at least 98% of any bureaucracy could be eliminated with a consequent 98% reduction in its follies. John's own enterprises reflected his view of a streamlined or absent administration. When he and Ralph Gorin set up the first time-shared computer system for all Stanford students to use in the mid-1980s, it was called LOTS for Low Overhead Time-Sharing System. It was run by a part-time student or two. John's web pages are a goldmine of ideas, technical, philosophical, and political. One way to remember John is to have a look at these pages. Just Google John McCarthy. He died on October 24, 2011 from complications of heart disease at his home at Stanford. He survived by his third wife, Carolyn Talcott of Stanford, two daughters, Susan McCarthy, whom we just heard, and Sarah McCarthy, a son, Timothy Talcott McCarthy of Stanford, a brother, Patrick of Los Angeles, two grandchildren, Kitty McCarthy of San Francisco, and Joseph Gunther of New York City, and his first wife, Martha Coyote. His second wife, Vera Watson, died in 1978 in a mountain climbing accident attempting to scale Annapurna in Nepal. John McCarthy's genius, puckish humor, and presence, along with his provocations to think more deeply, will be greatly missed by his colleague, family, and many, many friends. The next speaker up here. Thank you.